This week, specifically, we're going to be looking at space frames, and I wanted to kind of uh, have a little discussion with you um, to get you motivated in thinking about the um, the uses for uh, learning about uh, these kinds of topology and structural systems. And our project this week is going to, uh, I'm going to give you a fork, a choice. Um, you could either do um, what was done in basically something similar to what was done in computer viz for um, an adaptive truss system with adaptive columns uh, supporting it, or you can do um, the parking garage one, um, which is a facade. And I say parking garage only to say it's um, uh, it's just a simplified little rarefied part of a building, um, but it's a curvilinear surface that has some kind of a mesh or screen or whatever you want to apply to it as a surface. And we're developing a mounting system. The mounting system is very similar to the truss system that's supporting this, except that it's just constructed with different nodes to it. So both of these are useful to you. I strongly encourage you to think about doing this one because it's more relevant for um, some, of the, some of your future facade work. And um, to show you how relevant it is, this is a current project. This is the Salesforce Transit Center in San Francisco. This is hyperlinked. But here we have a structural uh, grid system supporting these uh, perforated tiles um, with a really wild um, uh, flowing uh, type of design. And all of this is intended to mask what is the transportation lane that's elevated above grade. So we we will see a lot of applications of, of these kinds of typology, like I say, uh, frame systems. Um, they're lightweight. They have um, a, a whole lot of advantages, which we will start to outline here. But one of the first things to start thinking about is this idea of a space frame is really a structural element um, that has a triangulation to it. Um, and and uh, I've kind of expanded the definition of this component of our, of our modules of advanced structural concepts because our space frames and our linear frame systems all have to be triangulated, um, structurally um, determinant, so to speak. Um, so um, I want you to begin thinking about that and recognizing this concept of a triangle as being a structurally stable um, surface. And sometimes that vision can be lost when we start working in three dimensions. So here we've highlighted this idea, and you can see this idea of triangulation happening. If you're drawing truss systems and they don't have this kind of triangulation system happening, we have a problem. It's not going to be structural. Um, and these are not new systems. Obviously, this is a, you can tell by the dated appearance of this airport interior. Uh, but a space truss system. Uh, but, it, but I put this up to give you um, more context with history. And there we have still a kind of an adaptive or structural column. And these have a really um, important purpose or function. Um, if we were to try and carry the load at one node, the stress concentrations would be really higher than what any one single node could, could contain. So these trusses that grab multiple nodes are designed to reduce the point loads at any one point of the support of the structure. So they, while they appear decorative, they are also functionally very important for carrying the loads down um, you know, to support the roof system. Another nice thing about this image is the idea we have a lot of structure running through, but because the members are very small, we still get a lot of light filtering down through the system. So the, the beam, if these were large I-beams or other kinds of structural components, they would create a lot of masking of the light, and the truss system tends to not do that. And I have some other illustrations, which is this one right here. Um, this is the Javits Center in New York City. Um, this is a photograph after it's gone through an extensive rehabilitation. Um, this is a, um, actually I don't know when, when this was originally constructed. I want to say the 80s, but uh, I can't confirm that. Um, but uh, it had been um, just recently restored. And um, uh, you get this feeling of a lot of structure, but it's still a lot of light is coming through the system. So there's this feeling of lightness and transparency, especially when it's all glazed components. But here we have a, a really massive space frame uh, system for a uh, convention center. And here again we have a transit system. These are done these ubiquitous, this type of support column and then structural um, roofing or other support systems. So here we have once again some kind of a truss system 
and then the idea of these columns coming out to carry loads and distribute the load, the point loads that would be um, pushed upon the roof truss system, and then carried down to a central point, and then a more massive column to carry the load down to grade. Truss systems can be really beautiful, um, and there's a lot of um, uh, variation that you can create. One of, uh, I think, one of the um, nice effects here is this idea of this expression of the truss getting larger at the maximum moment at the center of the span the, the system gets larger and it gets larger both at the top and the bottom this could have been articulated as a flat surface with a bowed truss but this i think is much more elegant and interesting so um obviously a, a really beautiful uh, play of that i think this is also hyperlinked no nope, i guess not um i threw this in because when we start to deal with these complex surfaces, really that helps us to understand even other complex um, ideas of, of the way we bring elements together. This isn't related. I do hope I have this hyperlink to the project. It's a little side distraction, but what it really is, it's amazing about a, a system of creating a structure from these really relatively small panel systems. Um, to this beautiful, um, curvaceous, complicated um, surface geometry. It all made from, obviously, um, probably laser-cut little panels, all digitally um, uh, programmed. And so um, I'd invite you to um, kind of read through and explore that. But once we start um, thinking about the idea of trust systems, and um, these, these, these mapping of elements to surfaces, we can start to understand um, a little better what's going on when we look at these. Um, and truss systems um, are also a jumping point to other kind, thinking about other kinds of structural systems. Uh, this is obviously the Sydney Opera House. This is made out of concrete um, with modular systems that aren't unlike what we're going to be doing with our truss systems, but they're prefabricated concrete. And um, I think that the corollary today would probably be we wouldn't use as much concrete because it has a, a heavy carbon footprint to it. Um, and it's very likely that we would think of modeling, um, or excuse me, modeling actually creating these surfaces out of other uh, lightweight materials, steels and carbon fiber or whatever. Um, and so this was an experiment I did thinking about how you would map that surface out and panelize it. Um, and, you know, even create the kind of uh, internal ribbing systems that might be architecturally interesting within it. So um, this is historic. This is a, from the 60s. But still today, we can still create these surfaces and carry forward um, a lot of the same aesthetics, but with a new sensitivity towards materiality and the materials that we use for sustainability. Another, uh, uh, not a space frame, but a map surface um, uh, uh, panelized system, but just breathtaking with what we are able to create. We still have the idea of the adaptive column spreading loads over these modular systems. It's not a space frame per se because it's not a triangular surface, but a lot of the same uh, concepts are happening here. And then this would be um, Zaha Hadid. Um, one of our, um, I guess, most beautiful projects, and I wanted to, I wanted to illustrate um, this one a little bit because of what, what's underneath, what the bones of it are actually uh, made out of. Um, but even at this level, we can see this idea of panelization of surfaces. But underneath this is a, um, a triangulated um, space frame. Um, all the blue elements are space frames. Um, to create what is um, a really complex and beautiful surface. And so, once again, I tried to kind of like think about that and simulate it. I didn't spend a lot of time with this, but this is where we are, you know, once you start to work with applying space frames to surfaces, the idea of generating all kinds of geometry from that um, are really up to you. So here we have um, a space frame, a panel on the outside, I can also apply a panel on the inside so I get a shape that is actually looks like solid surfaces even though we know space frames exist within the inside of it. And um, this is a link 
um, to a student doing a construction of that same surface, a really um, in-depth look at how the geometry is created for it. Um, this is hyperlinked. Oops, it's not hyperlinked. Maybe it's not. I don't know why that isn't. Um, but you can um, um, you could Google this, and if you wanted to find this project, you probably could. This is relatively recent. Some things to think about when we talk about panelizing space frames. In this case, the skin. So while we have straight members underneath, the exterior skin is a, um, I believe it's a fiberglass panel. And you'll notice that they have a curving geometry to them. So there is um, a, a flat surface and then a more articulate um, shape conforming surface applied to the top. This is a video. Um, it is hyperlink. So I invite you to go ahead and click through um, from the slide linkages to that. It really takes you through some really dramatic images of this place being built. Um, here's an image of the panels being built. So here we have these curved panels, um, fiberglass mesh layup. And um, I bring this up well. I put fire safety here. Did I write that? I don't know if I did or not. Um, but uh, there was a fire on this building, and this was a contributing um, source for fire, um, um, unlike a steel panel or other material. And, and I'm not really trying to be critical of the project at all. It's just that um, uh, fiberglass as compared to concrete and or steel um, is a lot more frail when we talk about fires and what would happen with them. So just to keep this idea of materiality in mind, it really did facilitate the construction of them, even though this is a really labor-intensive process because all these panels are different. Um, and this is a good, I guess, a, a really great image about how complex our projects are really becoming. So we have this um, triangulated um, structural element in blue. Then we have overlaid on this a, um, what I believe is a more conforming, flexible system in order to retain the actual final um, panel system that would be applied to it. But each panel is different, each grid is different, each overlay grid. So a lot is going into these. This uh, video, another important um, thing to explore, if you're interested, they believe this has some video with it, I'm not sure. But it describes all of the amounts of intricate detail that go into, oh, here it is, movie. So this is a, a few minutes movie that kind of outlines um, just a mathematical and engineering kind of thinking that is behind that system. To give you a kind of an appreciation for um, how complex our designs are becoming. I put this image in because it's really a clear indication of the trust system, but also what happens at this kind of termination. We still have, if you're to zoom in here, you can still see we have three arms to support or distribute load along this bar system. But then we have these thickened up members because they're collecting all of this load into this single area right here. And the same thing here where the space frame is getting really close to the ground probably to um, give it a, an extra stiffness for, for the idea that people would touch it. Um, you can see the stiffening up of the, of the truss system. And we can see that reflected here. We have these thickened up members where these load, where all of this load is being carried down to the ground. And here we have these beautiful plunging parts of the structure. So the inside and outside are getting merged together. And then you can get an idea of the whole idea of it being a kit of parts. So we see this pile of uh, truss elements. We see over here a pile of probably the nodes and uh, one by one screwed together and added one next to the other. Here's a good aerial shot showing kind of the cladding happening. Um, once again, that idea, look at the thick backup walls, the interior, another complex, whole beautiful complex interior um, activities going, will go on on the inside of this building. You get a real feeling for this um, space frame here from this view. This is a student who did it as a case study and that'll take you out to a little bit of a description of that. And just to kind of close this up, I, I know we go to these really complex surfaces and it really, um, we really don't have to model that way. We don't have to think that way. There are traditional ways. This is a, a probably a pumping station or some other um, um, 
you know, turn of the century building, but you notice the, um, the beautiful uh, arch systems um, and the structural framing systems that go along with it, all done before computers, before modeling, um, and uh, in many ways every bit is beautiful. So here's a little close-up of these uh, really uh, beautifully articulated uh, framing elements. And um, the idea of these kind of shapes is not new either. Um, Googie architecture, this is in the 60s. This is a picture of it probably in the 70s. This is a picture of it today. So a lot of the concepts that we are still generating, a lot of the ideas of flow and form and shape that we tend to um, kind of um, uh, uh, move towards in our aspirations are really, uh, really have a, a long history in them. Um, here's a nice uh, project that was done. It's called the Serpentine, Serpentine Pavilion. I, I want to um, click out to that. Sorry about the ad. And I don't think that's the right link to it because I don't believe that's a Serpentine Pavilion. So I have to apologize for that. Um, let's see if this goes to it here. There we go. Um, once again, um, a very lightweight project based on space frame constructions. And um, I think this is a really good read. A really beautiful project, a structurally amazing looking project. These space frames can be covered with panel systems, uh, but this is this is the um, excuse me. Go back on that one. Um, wanted to go to full screen here. Let me. So an, another transit station. Um, these are not space frames now. They're linear elements, but they're triangulated surfaces. Really could be modeled in much the same techniques we're doing. Um, but now they're covered with a fabric system. Um, fabric systems we will cover a little more in detail. So a lot of this idea of working with unitized elements over curvilinear surfaces will have many applications for us. I picked up this image because you get the feeling that there is a lot going on with the truss system here. It's almost like there are truss systems within truss systems. Um, the way the repeat elements happen, how they are, like so for instance, we have one truss, but it has two panel modules within it. Um, so you can imagine um, embedding more complexity in your unitized element in order to create these. Um, so we have four panels collecting down to a single bottom structural cord. So we get this idea of kind of simplifying as we move down from the framework. And once again, back to unbelievable uh, complexity. Um, you can see the um, um, what's going on in these kind of trust systems. I think this is a movie. And this is uh, Penn Station. And this, I don't see the kind of graphics here that used to be connected to this. I don't know if they pulled those out or not. Um, so I apologize for that. The, um, but what I wanted to show you is this is um, a historic uh, renovation. Um, so we have a, um, a historic building that needed a interior um, roofing system and um, uh, the techniques that we, we use that we think are modern might be uh, very applicable to historic preservation projects where we need to do in interventions of new construction with inside of old. So there's really no touch on architecture that we wouldn't want to uh, be aware of these kind of structural elements and the way we model them and conceive them. And so here we have another play out of a structural system like that. And the last thing I want to leave you with is this is a link to a case study. Um, this is a very complex project of a roof system and integrated structure. I don't know if you'll want to pursue looking at it right now, but what's really important about this case study is it lays out this kind of relationship between Revit and a rhinoceros, Rhino 3D, 
and how they resolved all of the complicated details to come up with a system. And at points saying they had to abandon uh, functionality with inside of Revit because it wasn't capable of doing it. So while we get frustrated with our software at a student level, it's also um, kind of, um, I guess, comforting to know that that is happening in the industry at the same time. And yet they find ways to resolve that and the storyline of how they resolve these difficulties I think is very um, informative to us especially for yourself in practice going forward. So um, that's your introduction to space frames.